Yes, Mr. Collins. Well, also, so moving on to the topic of privity with Sotheby's, I intend to adopt a similar structure, structure in my submissions as I did in relation to partnerships. I'll look first at the law, and I'll work through the judgment and, and draw in some of the evidence at the same time, and, and then finish with a conclusion. Uh, then at the very end, what I intend to do is do, uh, address a couple of points, only a couple that are in, in Sotheby's skeleton by way of essentially a sort of preemptive strike. Um, so that they can have a chance to respond to those should they feel the need. Um, but I certainly won't be going through that line by line. Usually so, known as getting a retaliation in first. <laughs> right. <laughs> that might be a better way to describe it. So anyway, um, but before, before starting that, I just want to, I want to make one point that, that's perhaps obvious, but it, this is, a, again, a response to something said in, in Sotheby's skeleton. We accept when it came to it, the dealings with Sotheby's, Mark Weiss Limited obviously had a, a sort of a dual, a dual function because it had its own interest in the painting. That's, that's one, one, one role it played. It was trying to sell a painting in which it had an interest. But so far as Fairlight was concerned, it was acting as agent. This is on, this is on the non-partnership hypothesis. Obviously, if there was a partnership, it had one function, and that was as agent of the partnership. Um, and the analysis that follows is obviously focused solely on that second role, its role as agent for Fairlight. Uh, but there's no issue uh, now as between Mark Weiss Limited and Sotheby's. It's common ground that Mark Weiss Limited was party to, the, to contract A. And focusing then on just on Fairlight's interest, and it's also the legal owner, but the, the contractual chain is clear. We've, we've, we've looked at this already. Fairlight gave Mark Weiss Limited authority. Mark Weiss Limited gave Sotheby's authority. And Sotheby's then concluded a sale contract with Nevada. Now, it's not in dispute that through that contractual chain, Sotheby's had authority to bind Fairlight to the contract with Nevada. Yeah. What's in dispute is whether one link in the chain was effectively removed so that Fairlight was in direct contractual relations with Sotheby's. And, that, and that's what the argument's about. Now, as far as the law is concerned, the, actual, the issues that arise for consideration in this context are similar to issues that actually arise in many other contexts. Whenever A engages B to perform some task, and then B, with the express or employment, applied agreement of A, then engages C, to perform some or all of that task. Questions that arise are, what, what's the nature of the relationship between A and C? A and in the event of a dispute, so C does something that causes A loss, um, if, there is, if there is a potential liability, which will turn on the first question, uh, to what extent can C rely on the terms agreed between B and C in defense of that claim? <coughs> be it a jurisdiction clause or a limitation of liability or something that shapes the scope of their, of, of, of their responsibility. And well, as I said, the, these issues aren't unique to agency disputes, nor are they new. Um, and in fact, to, to, to put them in context, I actually want to start with a case which isn't an agency case at all. Um, and one of the reasons I do this is the way the Sotheby's address this in their skeleton, they suggest there's this small, they say, small group of authorities, as if this is somehow some sort of quirky issue that only arises uh, when one's looking at agency and sub-agency. Uh, but, but it's not. It, these sort of the issues, the way I've described them in this broader way, are issues that arise in lots of different contexts. And, and secondly, what I'm going to say is a direct answer, and I illustrate by reference to authorities, a direct answer to one of the arguments advanced by Sotheby's. So the first case I want to take you to is the Privy Council decision in Pioneer Container, which is at tab one of the bundle of authorities. And this was a, a case of bailment and something. So somebody ships goods, a bill of lading, Part of the performance is subcontracted so that the person carrying the goods is not actually the person that has the contractual relationship with the owner of the goods. And the issue, the same, these same issues arose there. What is the nature of the relationship between 
the subcontractor <coughs> principle. Uh, so this is it? owners shipping goods by sea to carriers, yeah. uh, and carriers have authority to subcontract, which they do. Exactly. And, and you can see that from the, uh, yeah. and, and I'm not sure to what extent, some people are very familiar with this authority, others less so. But the, the facts are summarized in the head notes. Uh, and given, given that um, pithy summary, I probably don't need to take you through the head notes. Foggy collision. Sorry? Yeah. Foggy collision. Foggy collision, yeah. cargo gets lost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can the owners sue, sue the actual carriers, so the subcontractors? And if so, can the subcontractors rely on the jurisdiction clause in, in their bills of lading to which the owners of the cargo were not party? So as a matter of contract, there was no privity, but the Privy Council found a bailment workaround. Is that one way of putting it? Yes, it's, it's sometimes referred to the sort of shorthand that's used to describe this as, as a, as a sub-bailment on terms. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a uh, the, the, the carriers are liable because, um, because they're baileys, but because they have accepted the goods from the intermediary mm -hmm. on terms, the carrier is entitled to rely on those terms in defense of the claim brought by the owners of the goods. And, and we can see, perhaps if we just look at the bottom of the head, so the facts now we're, we've got out. Subparagraph H, or not subparagraph H, letter H, or at the bottom of page 3 to 4. Held dismissing the appeal, where goods have been sub bailed with the authority of the owner, the obligation of the sub bailey towards the owner was that of bailey for reward, and the owner could proceed directly against the sub bailey under the law of bailment without having to rely on the contract of sub bailment between the bailey and the sub bailey. That's the first bit, there was a direct liability then that a sub bailey who voluntarily took goods into his custody could only invoke terms of the sub bailment qualifying or otherwise affecting his responsibility to the owner if the owner had expressly or impliedly consented to those terms or had ostensibly authorised them, that the consent given by the first two groups of plaintiffs to their carriers to subcontract the carriage of goods on any terms was wide enough to embrace consent to an exclusive jurisdiction clause, the incorporation of which would have been in accordance with the reasonable commercial expectations. So that, that, that was the conclusion. Um, the, the, the single judgment was delivered by uh, Lord Goff. And the, um, the, the issue uh, is identified most concisely on page 335, again at letter F, uh, under the heading bailment and sub -bailment. Okay, the lordships are here concerned with a case where there has been a sub bailment. A bailment by the owners of the goods to a bailey, followed by a sub bailment by a bailey to a sub bailey. And the question has arisen whether, in an action by the owner against the sub bailey for loss of goods, the sub bailey can rely as against the owner upon one of the terms upon which the goods have been sub bailed to him by the bailey. I know the, the sidelining continues, but I don't need to uh, read through all of that. If we turn over the page 336, just above the letter B, the paragraph starting, the question whether a sub bailey can in circumstances <coughs> such as these rely upon such a term, and if so, upon what principle is entitled to do so, is one which has been considered in cases in the past, but so far neither by the House of Lords nor the Privy Council. And there's then a reference to, to um, some discussion of the topic. Yeah. Then approaching the central problem in the present case, the Lordships wish to observe that they're here concerned with two related questions. The first question relates to the identification of the relationship between the owner and the sub bailey. Once that question is answered, it is possible to address the second question, which is whether, given the relationship, it's open to the sub bailey to invoke as against the owner the terms upon which he received the goods from the bailey. So that's, that's what I, I, I said at the beginning, there's these, these two issues, and they arise in different contexts. And, and the same, would be, same is true here. Um, so what is the relationship between Fairlight and Sotheby's? And then assume, and this hasn't happened, but assume, say, that Sotheby's had damaged the painting because it, it gets delivered to them by Mark Weiss. And Fairlight pops up and says, well, I'm the owner. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to see you because you've damaged my property. The question would arise to what extent can Sotheby's rely on the terms of the agreement between Mark Weiss Limited and Sotheby's. And there's then, um, I, I, I probably don't need to, to, to work through this because you've, you've already seen uh, what the conclusion is. But if we perhaps move on to page 338. Uh, 
uh, and the, the, the relevant passage, the, here the relevant passage it is quite long, but um, that's why I could ask, well, was that you read yourself from letter C down to G. Yes. So, my lady, you'll see immediately after the words quoted from, from Lord Denning's judgment in Morris and Martin, there's, there's a statement, his expression of opinion on this point has proved to be attractive to a number of judges. And then there's a, a list of uh, cases in which it's been found attractive. Then on 339, in order to decide whether like is just sustained, to accept the principle so stated by Lord Denning and Morris, it's necessary to cons consider the relevance of the concept of consent in this context. It must be assumed that, on the facts of the case, no direct contractual relationship has been created between the owner and the sub bailee. The only consent, sorry, the only contract created by the sub bailment <coughs> being that between the bailee and sub bailee. Even so, if the effect of the sub bailment is that the sub bailee voluntarily receives into his custody the goods of the owner and so assumes towards the owner the responsibility of a bailee, then to the extent that the terms of the sub bailment are consented to by the owner, it can properly be said that the owner has authorized the bailee so as to regulate the duties of the sub bailey in respect of the goods entrusted to him, not only towards the bailey, but also towards the owner. And then skipping down to just below letter D, the new paragraph, such a conclusion finding its origin in the law of bailment rather than the law of contract does not depend for its efficacy either on the doctrine of privity of contract or on the doctrine of consideration. So, so my lord, I, that's obviously a, that's a, that's a bailment case. But the same issues arise uh, when, when you're looking at, a, at an auction house. Because I, actually, an auction house uh, will frequently also be a bailey. It, it, it's, it serves an agency function if it concludes a contract between the seller and the buyer. But it is often also a bailey because it receives the goods for the auction or might receive them in order to deliver them to the buyer. But it's, it's relevant mainly because it illustrates the point that, that one of the issues in the present case, namely privity of contract, this sort of grappling with this and deciding what, what, to what extent the sub bailey or sub agent is entitled to rely on its own terms is not unique to agency. Um, and the issue may be more acute in an agency context because the principal function <coughs> of the agent is to create privity with another party, and that's their, yep. their job: is to bring is to bring the principal into a contractual relationship with another party. So the issue might be more acute, might, might be more finely balanced in the agency context, but, but it's not unique to those cases. And the issue here, as I understand it, is whether there were circumstances from which the judge could properly infer that there was, by agreement of all three relevant parties, um, an agreement which bound Sotheby's vis-a-vis Turner. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. And I, the, I, I've deliberately started with, a, what one might say, a sort of I think it's like a quite broad approach yeah. by trying to put this into a context because, because of the suggestion that this was some quirky rule of agency. Well, except, and we're not dealing with bailment here. If no, we were, no. Pioneer Container would be in point, but the mm. fact is we're not, so you well, have to find a direct contractual relationship. Yeah. Uh, we're, well, we, we are not, but of course, one of the points made by Sotheby's and their skeletons, well, it would just be ridiculous that they, they couldn't rely on the terms against, against yeah. the owner of the goods. Well, that depends because, of course, if <coughs> If it depends on what is the claim that's anticipated when that when that submission is made. As I said, if it's a claim that Sotheby's have damaged the painting, then we would actually be suing them as Baileys, yes, or suing them in <coughs> negligence, saying they assumed a, a duty of care. Um, and in those situations, they would be running precisely these arguments. So it, it's an answer we say to, to some of the points made in Sotheby's skeleton. But I agree that the issue here is is a narrow and more specific one. Isn't, isn't the, um, the comparator, if um, Sotheby's had sold the painting and kept the money, um, and 
you were suing them for the money for your share in the painting. Well, then we wouldn't have a contractual claim, but we might have a claim in conversion. Um, our, our, and Mark Weiss Limited would certainly have a contractual claim. <coughs> so Mark Weiss Limited would have the contractual claim against Sotheby's because it has a contractual relationship with Sotheby's. If, if the painting was sold without authority or, or something like that, then, then Fairlight is the owner, but not in a contractual relationship with Sotheby's, might have a claim in conversion. So there are, there are, suggested it was sold without authority. Oh, no, 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 that's not suggested. Well, uh, the, but the, um, or if... No, the comparator is simply that there is, there is or isn't a, a direct contractual yeah. relationship, but um, they sell your picture and they, and they then keep your money. Um, so how, how do you deal with that obstacle? Well, Mark Weiss would have the claim against, the contractual claim against Sotheby's for the debt. Because Mark Weiss has the contract with Sotheby's. Now, the turning to the agency cases, then the, the most important of those is the decision in Henderson and Merritt, which is a tab two of the authorities bundle, a decision of the House of Lords from 1995, or certainly reported in 1995. Now, th this is a substantial authority. The, the House of Lords had to consider a, a number of issues in relation to potential liability of agents to principle. And a lot of them aren't relevant to the issue you're grappling with today. That's because there are a number of different claims were all lumped together and, and resolved as one. Um, My impression is there isn't really any disagreement between the parties about what the sub-agency cases say. It's just whether they apply on the facts, or rather how, how they apply on the facts. I mean, I'm not trying to cut you short, yeah. but I don't think there's any. I don't think there is any disagreement about the underlying principles of law, as stated in the Henderson and Merritt cases and the others in the bundle. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. That, about that's that. right. But one point um, made by the judge, and this is also picked up in Sotheby's skeleton, is is essentially this. Well, the, the sub these sub agency cases don't apply because there was privity of contract between Fairlight and Sotheby's. And we say, well, no, that, that's not the correct approach. These sub-agency cases must be applied in order to determine whether there's privity I of contract. I, for my part, I don't see their argument like that at all. I think they're saying um, all these uh, agency cases address factual situations where uh, there is an arm's length. I mean, all the, these are traditional agency agreements, the sub -agency brokers and names and all the rest of it. At arm's length, independent third party uh, agency agreements with a, a clear agency agreement with a clear sub-delegation of part of the function so allocated. But that's a million miles away, say Sotheby's, from this situation where you have co-owners. Um, so I, I don't think, I may have misread it, but I don't think they do, as it were, uh, start from the, the, the wrong end of it in that sense. No. Well, maybe, maybe I was reading too much into, into what was said, but I'll come to the relevant passage, uh, to the passage of the judgment that I'm referring to. But, but even though they're co-owners, this right, going back to the point I made, just pretty much the first point I made this afternoon, so far as Fairlight's interest is concerned, Mark Weiss Limited is, is acting as agent. Because Fairlight's the legal owner and has a beneficial interest in the painting. We've seen the email by which it authorized Mark Weiss Limited to sell the painting. Mark Weiss Limited then enters into a contract with Sotheby's. The only way that, that um, Fairlight can be made party to that contract, or at least, or indeed, party to the contract with the ultimate buyer, is through the agency of Mark Weiss. But is the question then um, whether or not MWL is um, acting as agent for Fairlight? in entering contract A to the exclusion of Fairlight being a part of the contract. Yes. Or to the inclusion. B. So the, that's, and it could be either, could it? The, so it, it, you see what I mean? It's yeah, either it's, exclusively and solely uh, as agent, or acting as agent, but so as to make Fairlight a party. Oh, yeah, there are, there, there are two possible outcomes. There are. There's the inclusion and the exclusion. Yes. 
Uh, and that's exactly what these authorities are designed to help you decide. You look at the authorities and say, well, does it have the, the starting point, the general rule, is that where an agent engages a sub-agent, there's no privity of contract between the principal and the sub-agent. The question but, is, does that rule engage? Because does that rule, none of these authorities deal with um, a co-ownership very different, or very different environment. You know, cargo owners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, brokers, yeah. and all, all the more traditional. It, it is a different environment. And perhaps we, then we, if we analyse it this way, assume for the sake of argument uh, that it wasn't a co-owner. Mm -hmm. So Fairlight is the 100% owner. Then in those circumstances, I don't think there would be any difficulty seeing that the, these plainly apply, these authorities, because Mark Weiss Limited is appointed as agent a sale. It then appoints Sotheby's as an agent for sale, who then concludes a contract with the third party buyer. The question of whether there's direct privity of contract between Fairlight and Sotheby's in those circumstances, we say would clearly, would clearly be determined by applying these authorities. And indeed, although this is a, this, I mean, Henderson and Merritt is about managing agents and underwriting agents. You see the issue, some of the older authorities they refer to, and I'll, and I'll take you to passages which give the facts, mm. do actually concern sale of goods. There's one that concerns sale of wheat. So it's, th these issues aren't unique to insurance. I know that some of the more recent exciting cases have been insurance <laughs> cases. Um, but it, it is a, it's a general issue that arises. We have an agency and a sub-agency. Um, so that then the question is, is, is it different because Mark Weiss Limited is a co-owner. And, and the answer to that, we say, well, no, because so far as Fairlight is concerned, it is still acting as agent. When a co-owner, if you have two co-owners, and, and one of them is authorized to sell the asset that they co-own, mm -hmm. then that person is acting as principal so far as their own interest is concerned, but agent so far as the other co-owner is concerned. And what the difference between sell it on my behalf or sell it on our behalf? Well, sell it, uh, no, because even if, if it's co obviously if it's partnership, then that's different, because then there's just, yeah, it's a partnership asset, and, and the agent is only... No, is we're talking about a situation where it isn't a partnership. Uh, the, whether the person said sell it on my behalf or sell it on our behalf would make no difference, because it's still authorising the agent yes, to dispose of... I, mean, I was of, seeing to sum, yeah. sum up your submission. Yeah. They don't make, it doesn't matter whether it's sell it on my behalf or sell it on our behalf. That, that's correct, yes. Because what's important is that the agent has authority to dispose of the principal's interest. It doesn't matter whether that's a 100% interest or a 50% interest. So Mark Weiss Limited is, so far as Fairlight's interest is concerned, still acting as agent for Fairlight and then engaging Sotheby's as a sub-agent so far as Fairlight is concerned. I mean, that, no doubt, may be the legal analysis. But as a matter of commercial common sense, we have the co-owners who, between them, are arranging for their painting to be consigned by Sotheby's. Anyone in that situation must have envisaged the consignment would take effect on Sotheby's standard terms, uh, as indeed has duly happened in this case. And it does seem intuitively extraordinarily odd if your client can escape from any contractual liability vis-a-vis -vis other bits just because of the agency machinery which these commercially linked parties have chosen to employ. Well, it, it, can, escape, it can escape from a contractual liability. It doesn't mean it's completely free to completely disregard the terms for the reasons we looked at when we looked at Pioneer Container and also come out and there's part of reference to it in Henderson and Merritt. Because it consented to the consignment to other bits, I would have known that that was on terms. Whether or not it looked at those terms doesn't, yeah. doesn't really matter. It would know that Sotheby's would take those on terms. Yes. It would then be bound in the sense of bound that it's meant in, there's reference to in Henderson Merritt, but we see it more clearly in Pioneer Container. So it couldn't just sue Sotheby's and disregard a jurisdiction clause or limitation of liability. But it doesn't mean it's contractually obliged to Sotheby's. Now, Sotheby's could have sought to recover the full amount from Mark Weiss Limited. Because that was the contract, that was the party with which it was in contract. It had a contract, a co but, it, but it settled with Mark Weiss Limited and is now seeking to recover the balance from Fairlight. 
And it can only do that, it can only take that course if there is privity of contract between Fairlight and Sotheby's. And I'm just struggling. It seems as if you, you want to have the benefits of the contract and pick and choose the, uh, the liabilities. How is that not no, no, a, a correct characterization no, no, of, of your position? Not the benefits. Because, well, what the authorities make clear is there is a distinction. In, in this sort of situation where one person is given authority to sell and they give that authority to another party, that, that party, in this case Sotheby's, does have authority to bind my client, Fairlight, to a contract with a third party. Yes. So it takes that, takes that burden. And, and, and in fact, mm -hmm. so, so long as Sotheby's had actual or apparent authority to enter into a contract on those terms, it's bound by all of the terms between it and the third party. So if Sotheby's sell for nine million, so it's, assume that it's actually less than the actual authority, but if it had actual authority, my, my client would be bound by that because Sotheby's did actually have authority to bind my client to Nevada. But it doesn't follow from that. This is what the authorities make clear. It doesn't follow from that, that there is privity of contract between my client and Sotheby's. So well, as we, what I could probably do then is, is move on from, because again, Henderson, as you said, it doesn't really appear to be in dispute. And again, that's looking at it in quite a, a general way. But it, I, I, I included it in the bundle because it's House of Lords authority. Well, absolutely. And which, but I mean, the key passages are very clearly set out in yeah. the skeleton arguments. And as I say, I don't understand there to be any dispute at all about the sub agency cases. But I was still, just bef before leaving them, I would like to just touch on um, Prentice, Prentice Donegan was probably. I can probably just limit myself to, to that. That's in yes, the bundle. It's, the next tab. It's, in, it's in the next tab. Now, this is another insurance case, so they, this time not uh, uh, agents, managing agents, and underwriting Prentice. agents acting for names. This is actually placing insurance in the London market. So you have uh, foreign clients, New York brokers, New York brokers appoint London brokers, London brokers obtain the insurance, the London brokers pay, because this is marine insurance, they have to pay the premiums themselves, and they then look to recover the premium from the New York broker. So this is equivalent to Sotheby's seeking to recover the money from Mark Weiss Limited. Um, Sorry, say that again, please. This is equivalent to Sotheby's seeking to recover from Mark Weiss Limited. It's, and I don't want to labor the point by saying it over and over again. I'm focusing only on Mark Weiss's second role, selling, selling Fairlight's interest. Uh, obviously, so far as its own interest was concerned, it was principal. But so as far as Fairlight is concerned, uh, Fairlight appoints Mark Weiss, Mark Weiss appoints Sotheby's, Sotheby's concludes the sale, Sotheby's now looking to recover monies that it says it's owed, owed to it. That's really factually identical to what we have here, where the London brokers are trying to recover a premium from the New York brokers. And one of the New York brokers' defense is, well, I was only acting as agent. You should actually recover from the principals. And that's why this issue arose as to whether or not there was privity of contract between the London agents and the foreign <coughs> principals, or only as between the London agents and the New York brokers. Uh, so that's the facts. And the relevant uh, passages, uh, the first one starts on page 329. under the heading, in the left-hand column, under the heading, the primary defense, privity of principal and sub-agent. There's a reference there to, to Bowstead, which also, there's a reference to that in, in Henderson and Merritt as well, and it's described yes. as an accurate statement of the law. Yeah. And, and underneath that, you see, just at the very bottom of that column, in effect, therefore, it has to be the intention of all three parties, principal, agent, and sub-agent, to affect a direct contractual relationship between the principal Yes. and the sub-agent. And well, that's the point you made when you said, isn't it really about this? Yes, and, and exactly. That, 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 is, that is the issue. Oh, and of intention objectively construed. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then just over the page on, on 330, just at the bottom of 
the page. It is, it is sidelined. This is picking up on a, on a point I made earlier. I'm uh, just starting one, two, three, four, five, six. About six lines up from bottom, there's a sentence saying similarly. In every case of agency and sub-agency, the ultimate principle and the ultimate third party will be brought into direct contractual relation. That, however, does not prevent the general rule that a principal and a sub-agent are not in privity of contract with one another. Yes. And that shows that the fact the agent who appoints a sub-agent is an agent is not determinative of his ability to disclaim any liability to the sub-agent he appoints. A return to that consideration. And there's then um, a reference to New Zealand and Australian land and, and Watson. Um, that was one of the authorities referred to in the skeleton, but not included in the bundle. Uh, that was a case uh, that involved, I mentioned there was a case involving the sale of wheat, so it's not just a, it's not a insurance issue. Um, that, was a, that was a sale of goods issue. Then over the page, again, at page 331, there's a reference to another of the authorities that is referred to in the skeleton, but not included in the bundle, because you see it's calico printers. And it's actually in calico printers where you first find the reference to precise proof. Yeah. Uh, and we have sidelined um, the passages that we rely on. I'm not quite sure what an imprecise proof would be. I mean, well, I, th I think. on that conundrum. Well, I, th yeah. I, 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 think, I think that what that means is, is what, what they're saying is not, not enough just to have general evidence that the principal agreed that the agent could appoint a sub-agent. But precisely because that's not enough, you've got to have, when, so when it says precise proof, it means proof going to this precise issue of was there an intention to create privity? Yes. Between. Mm -hmm. One needs to focus on the real question, in other yeah. words. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's what's being said. And I, and I don't put it any higher than that. Mm -hmm. Then over the page, uh, you see the conclusion in relation to what is called the Debush and Alt exception. Um, and and we, again, we've sidelined, it's 332 column one, we, we've sidelined the passage we've learned. About four lines down, in my judgment, the authorities show that the Debush and Alt exception is indeed an exception and a narrow one. And the burden must be on the defendants to show some special factors, in this case, to raise an argument that the general rule makes way for the exception. Such factors might be found, for instance, in the direct relations that might exist between offshore and the plaintiffs. To put that into context, the equivalent here would be saying direct relations between Sotheby's and Fairlight. Mm. Uh, or in the consideration that, as Mr. Gaisman put it, the delegation by the defendants to the plaintiff was complete, affecting a complete substitution of the defendants by the plaintiff, to pick up the word substitute in Debush and Alts. So that would be where uh, 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 something similar there, and I know it's more complicated because we're in a co-ownership case, but if, you, if you're just focusing on Fairlight's interest, that, that would be a case where the agent, rather than appointing a sub-agent, effectively there's a substitution. One agent is replaced by the, the second agent. So that's another case where you, we, I mean, it sounds obvious when you state it, but, but if we say there's a substitution, then there has to be a Privative contract between the principal and indeed the agent isn't properly called a sub-agent in that situation. Hmm. Um, or, and the other example then he says, indicating that the defendant's sole responsibility to offshore was to procure a competent placing broker. So again, drawing it into the facts of our case, if uh, the we, we looked at the email, if the email had said, I authorize you to appoint Sotheby's, then this is the territory we'd be in because uh, because um, Mark Weiss Limited would be saying, well, I was only appointed to find the agent for sale. I wasn't actually a acting as an agent for sale. But we're not in that territory either. So you, what, what these authorities show is you've got to look for these sort of special factors before you can conclude that there is privity of contract between the principal uh, and the sub-agent. And the other authority, I won't, I won't we don't need to go through it, but in tab seven is the Grosvenor and National Bank of Abu Dhabi case, where again you see then, then Mr. Justice Flo, as he then was, applying the same principles, again in a very different context. It's a banking context, so it's not, not insurance. Um, but 
that again, what you see is the same principles um, being applied. Yes, well, that's why I say they seem to be yeah. fair and pretty yeah. well understood. The question is how you apply them. Yeah. So then, now then, um, the, which means I can move on to look at the actual judgment yes. and, and the relevant passages. So we can, we can put those authorities away and take out the core bundle again. <clears throat> and tab five, where we find the judgment. And the issue is... Sorry, it's on the facts. I didn't get your last point. Um, I mean, here, we, you said the email. We've got the email on the 17th of May. Mm. But we know that, um, in accordance with Mr. Kovitz's request, he was consulted on the decision to consign to Sutherland. Yes. I'll, I'll take... Fact. fact. Yes. Mm. Yes. So, so and before either... Con well, before contract A. Yes. yes. But again, the authorities... And I, this is what, and I hope I'm not taking them too quickly. The authorities are clear that, that the mere fact that the principal consents to the appointment of the sub-agent is not enough to bring them into privity of contract. Mm. I've just made a note of your helpful submission, so you need special factors before you can conclude privity. And one example you gave was knowledge on the part of the principal of the onwards contract. Uh, maybe, maybe I've missed that. I'll, I can read it No, I, I don't think I said that. And if I did, I, I misspoke. No, okay. the, the, factor, the special factors I, I was drawing out were the, the ones uh, identified uh, by, by Mr. Uh, Justice Ricks as, um, in the Prentice Donegan case. If there's a complete substitution, so if Sotheby's had replaced Mark Weiss, that might be a special factor. If Mark Weiss's only role had been to, a, to appoint Sotheby's, then that would be a special factor. Mm. But the authorities are absolutely clear that the fact the principal knows the agent is going to delegate to a sub-agent and consents to it is not enough. Yes, but there may be more. And oh. We're in a situation where Mr. Kovitz, as I understand it, I mean, he gave all the evidence and was cross-examined. No doubt it was put to him that this was a case where there was more. Yeah. And, and it's just a pure question of fact for the judge. Well, except, well, well, let's see. Well, I'll take you through the judgment because, yeah. because what you, the, this issue um, it, it is addressed in paragraph 17 through to 25 of the judgment. But but I, I say address, but it's, it's not really properly addressed at all. Because when answering the privity question, the court has to give careful consideration to the two relevant agreements. That's the agreement between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited, and the agreement between Mark, between Mark Weiss Limited and Sotheby's. Um, but careful consideration of those two agreements, because that's, that's the only way they can establish privity. It is, it is through the agency of Mark Weiss Limited that it's said that Fairlight came into privity of contract with Sotheby's. You, you need a careful analysis of the two agreements to see if that is what the three parties objectively intended. And, and that careful consideration is conspicuously absent from this judgment. Now, so far as the first um, agreement is concerned between that is between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. I, I, we've looked at the email. I don't need to take you uh, to that again. Uh, but it's clear from that that Mark Weiss Limited was being given authority to sell the painting. It wasn't, to pick up on the words Prentice Donegan, it wasn't a case where, where Mark Weiss's sole responsibility was to appoint Sotheby's or Christie's or someone else to perform that role. So Mark Weiss Limited was being given authority to sell, although it was contemplated in the email, that it might itself appoint somebody else to assist with that process. Uh, isn't, isn't that what happened then? So yes. We have the 17th of May email, great. Mm. Matters move on, and Sotheby's is going to be appointed. And then there is an agreement. So an agreement you haven't talked about between Fairlight and MWL, that MWL would appoint Sotheby's under yeah. contract A. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, was the, 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 so the, the point is, just I'll pause on the email, and then, then, I'll, then I'll move on to the the judgment and the evidence. If, you, if you're stopping there at the email, that clearly did give Mark Weiss Limited authority to bind Fairlight to a contract of sale. 
But equally clearly, it did not give Mark Weiss Limited, that email itself didn't give Mark Weiss Limited authority to bind Fairlight to a contract with another agent such as Sotheby's. So applying the law, if you, if you stop there. Hmm. So then, then we pick up the, the judgment. Uh, there's reference to, to Calico and Grosvenor Casinos in paragraphs uh, 17, uh, in paragraph 19, sorry. Yes. Then, then picks up, I noted above that it was common ground that by contract A, MWL acting as agent for Fairlight and on its own behalf, appointed Sotheby's as exclusive agent and granted Sotheby's the exclusive right to offer and sell the painting by private treaty to a prospective buyer identified by Sotheby's. Now, well, that, that paragraph is consistent with Fairlight's analysis because MWL was acting as Fairlight's agent for sale. As such, it granted Sotheby's authority to sell, i.e., I, I, in sub to use the language of sub agency, it appointed Sotheby's as sub agent so far as Fairlight's interest was concerned. Now, the, the paragraph refers to this being common ground, and Sotheby's pick up on that in their skeleton with, with a selective quotation from paragraph 12 of Fairlight's defense. But rather than come back to that when I'm looking at Sotheby's skeleton, I just want to show you the way it was put so you can see what the common ground was. Uh, it's in this bundle at tab 16, page 219. Under the heading, Subagency with Sotheby's. Starting at paragraph 8, you see, on around 17th of May, Mr. Kovitz, acting on behalf of Fairlight and Mr. Weiss, on behalf of MWL, by an agreement made part orally and part in its own emails, agreed that Fairlight would employ MWL to sell, or endeavour to sell the property. Then down at paragraph 10, in around June 2011, Mr. Kovitz authorised MWL to employ Sotheby's as a sub agent to find a buyer for the property at or above a price of 12 million. And then 11, pursuant to the main agency agreement, MWL, with the knowledge and consent of Fairlight, employed Sotheby's as sub agent for the sale of the property, pursuant to an agreement signed by MWL on the 23rd of June. Then 12, under the terms of the sub agency agreement, MWL, acting as agent for Fairlight and on its own behalf, appointed Sotheby's as exclusive agent. So that's where the language is, the common ground language is picked up from, from paragraph 12. Yeah. Um, uh, and then over the page, paragraph 13, in the premises, MWL delegated its agency functions for sale of the property to Sotheby's for a three-month period as stipulated in the sub-agency agreement. So I, mean, I, I, I don't pull back from any of the language used in this pleading. All I warn against is taking just a few words in isolation and relying on those to say, oh, well, it's common ground that effectively there was privity of contract because there wasn't, if you read this passage yep. as a whole, it's very clear what's being said. And of course, when an agent enters into a contract with a sub-agent, it is doing so on behalf of its principal. But, but what, what the judge didn't accept is this, what he described as a construct. Mm. So this idea that you have an overarching main agency agreement and the agreement to employ Sotheby's it is part of that overarching agency agreement. What the judge well, seems to have thought is that the agreement at paragraph 10 in June 2011 was a straightforward authorization to enter into an agency. It wasn't a sub-agency situation. Well, uh, so he did this, this hmm. con that, that's as I understand, I may be wrong, but. Well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come on to that. So that's paragraph 20 of the judgment. It's referring to the common ground. I'm just showing you what, yeah. what, yeah. The, what the common ground was and where the, where the language comes from. Paragraph 21, it says, the evidence at trial showed that Mr. Weiss asked Mr. Kovitz for Fairlight's consent to enter into the sale of the painting. Mr. Kowitz accepted in cross-examination that he gave his agreement on behalf of Fairlight to, to Mr. Weiss to deal on the basis of consigning the painting to Sotheby's for a sale to a Sotheby's client at 10.75 million. Now, well, as, the, as the authorities make clear, consent to this sub-agency, which is what's being said here. So, so if, if Mr. Weiss goes to Mr. Kowitz and says, actually, because he, he's already got his authority to sell. And he says, I want to consign it to Sotheby's to sell, so that they can sell it to one of their clients for 10.75 million. That's not enough to create privity. That's just a normal case. 
where the agent seeks the permission of the principal to appoint the sub-agent. So, uh, so that paragraph, we say, that, that's not enough. That, that, that's just the standard case referred to in the authorities where the principal has authorized the appointment of the sub-agent. Well, I mean, now, the question is whether that is all that was agreed. And well, let, it may help then to look at, look at some of the evidence. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not clear precisely what evidence the judges, I mean, he says the evidence at trial shows. Yes. But it's not clear what evidence he's referring to. Yeah. So if I start, I'll take some of Mr. Kovitz's evidence, then some of Mr. Weiss's evidence, because obviously those are the two relevant individuals so far as their interactions are concerned. Yes. The, the, that evidence is in the supplemental, supplemental, supplemental bundle. Uh, and it's tab two for um, Mr. Kovitz's first statement. And the relevant passage, and we'll see actually there's, there's pretty much broad agreement between them as to, as to what happened. The relevant passage starts on page 140. The tab two, page 140, paragraph 90. Uh, so, first of all, in paragraph 90, he says, following the discussion <coughs> Mark and I had, I sent the email, and then you see the reference to the email that we've already looked at. And then... It, Then, I mean, not all the evidence he gives in the paragraphs in between is relevant, but he then talks about what he was still thinking of um, keeping it. Yep. And then over, over the page on 95 is where, we, where the Sotheby's point gets picked up. In June 2011, Mark sought my approval to consign the painting to Sotheby's, but then to sell it by private treaty. He then described some of the communications, um, but, but, but nothing uh, turns o o on those those paragraphs because it doesn't show you what the agreement between uh, Mr. Kovitz and Mr. Weiss was. But if we, for three, if we pick it up on paragraph 103, there he says, between the period of Mark sending me the email from James with the offer of 10 million and the acceptance of 10.75 million, I had a number of conversations with Mark. 104, from Mark's email of 20th of June to me, where he said, so let's speak in the morning. And other emails during this period, those conversations must have been on the morning of the 21st of June. Mark and I discussed the offer of 10.75 million. I recall all Mark told me he did not think that Sotheby's buyer would go any higher on this basis. I agreed that Mark could agree this offer. And then on 23rd of June, Mark sent me a copy of the contract. He had agreed with Sotheby's with a simple message for your information. So there you see uh, the agreement. And of course, further agreement was necessary because we've seen the original email only authorized Mark Weiss to sell for 12 million or more. Yep. And here what you have is Mark Weiss, Mark Weiss going to Mr. Kovitz and saying, well, can I sign at Sotheby's and they sell it at 10.75 million? And the answer comes back, yes. And that leaves open the question whether that was the only purpose of our probably numerous conversations during this period or whether it may have gone further than that, and really become equivalent, as my lady has said, to effectively an agreement between them to employ Sotheby's as agents, not sub-agents at all. Well, well ex except can, we, the, the indicators that are consistent with the sub-agency analysis are, well, firstly, there, there's no officer of Fairlight who signed the agreement. So it had to be Sotheby's as agent had to be, that, that contract had to be concluded through Mark Rice. And it was, it said, concluded through Mark Weiss. Mark Weiss, we can see, had been appointed as agent for sale, because we've seen the email. Sorry, so, so. that's the 17th of May? Yes. But again, is that, just in fairness, is, I, I, have, I struggle with that, with it being some form of agency appointment. Is it not just giving permission? But it's giving, it's giving, giving authority. authority. But that's very different, isn't it? Mm. To, Setting up a sort of a, an agency, an agency relationship. 
Well, no, I mean... It, of the type, you know, certainly not for reward. There was no additional you know, sort of payment for services. But it's giving permission to a co-owner to proceed at a certain price. But you say that was the, that's described as your main head agency, and everything after that is sub to it, as opposed to the June 2011 agreement being a separate, a separate deal, as it were. Yes. I, and, and the reason I, I mean, it, it is an agency. If you give somebody authority to enter into a contract on your behalf, mm. that you are making them your agent. In a sense, you are. Of yeah. I mean, if, if they're not your agent, they can't conclude. No, of course, yeah. in a sense, you are. But mm. it's a question of what the authorities contemplate in facts. Yes. As to whether this is that sort of formal agency agreement. But then, and what you see here is a description of a conversation. Because they're not, he's not selling for more than 12 million, which is what the email has said. Mm. So Mark Weiss comes back to him and says, well, let's sell for 10.75 million. So he does need additional authority before he can do the deal with Sotheby's or to sell at this price. Or fresh authority. But so that's, I mean, well, you've, you've got the point. You've seen the email, then you have these conversations, which have developed over time. Because, but you say fresh authority, but don't, don't forget that the original 17th of May email itself contemplated that yeah. Mark Weiss Limited might consign it to somebody, and the, and the obvious but you... At not less than 12, quite whatever. Yeah, and it was Sotheby's or Christie's or whoever he might consign it to. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all that it said is, I want to be consulted before you do it. And what you have, then, is this consultation process for the consignment and an extension of the authority so that it can be sold at a lower price or an alteration of the authority. So that's, that, that, that's what... Um, Mr. Kovic says, and then if you... And this was not challenged? Well, um, he was cross-examined cross on it. I'll just show you what Mr. 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 Weiss said, because actually, in terms of the, the interactions between them, um, th there is a, a broad degree of uh, agreement. If we turn in tab five, to page one, one, three, Um, he's here dealing with uh, 113 says I spoke to Mr. McDonald I believe I said something along the lines of you need to do better in terms of the offer McDonald said the best they could do was 10.75 million and that it would be a quick sale and importantly an export sale I explained that I had to discuss with Mr. Kovitz which I did to Mr. Kovitz I explained that while I had hoped for a minimum of 12 million so pausing there that's a reference back to the the, the figure in the email. This seemed to be a good, strong offer. I recommended that we accept it. Mr. Cobbett's agreed. I got back to Mr. McDonald and agreed the deal on behalf, he says, on behalf of Invalio and Fairlight in principle, a sale price of 10.75 million. So I'm so sorry, which paragraph is this? I sorry, 113. 113. On, okay. page, on page 116. 166. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, 166. Yeah. So we say, if you look at the evidence of both, both of the parties, that conversation was pr pretty, uh, pretty consistent. Well, in interestingly, Mr. Kovic, I'm sorry I'm mm. interrupting you so much. No, that's... I do apologise. Um, but Mr. Weiss doesn't even mention the 17th of May. Not in the passages we have in the bundle, because it's only the selected passages. Oh, I see. Yes, you're um, quite right. And I cannot recall whether he does in his in, in the witness statement if you take it as a whole. Um, uh, we we can check that and provide the necessary page if that would be helpful. So now, obviously, this unquestionably establishes that Fairlight agreed that Mark Weiss Limited could consign the painting to Sotheby's for Sotheby's to sell at ten point seven five million. But we say that no does nothing to advance an argument that Fairlight authorised Mark Weiss Limited to create privity of contract between Fairlight and Sotheby's. Agreed the deal on behalf of MWL and Fairlight. But it is acting on, on behalf of Fairlight as well. Whenever an agent appoints a sub-agent to do something for the principal. So, for example, the London brokers, when they're instructed by the New York brokers to place the marine insurance, they're placing the marine insurance on behalf of the principal, the owner of the vessels. But it doesn't create 
privity of contract between the principal and the London brokers. And again, with the Henderson and Merritt, the underwriting agents will conclude, they're appointed to conclude contracts of insurance on behalf of the names. And they do so, but it doesn't create privity of contract between the underwriting agents and the names themselves. So, so we say you need to look for something more to establish, because there was undoubtedly this chain, because if we're, if we're going to name it individuals rather than entities, Mr. Kovitz speaks to Mark Weiss, and Mr. Weiss speaks uh, to Sotheby's. We have the email and we have these discussions um, in which we can see that Mark Weiss had authority to sell. And then when you turn to look at the agreement between Mark Weiss uh, and Sotheby's, you can see that that only purports to be an agreement between Mark Weiss and Sotheby's. Now, uh, we've already looked at that briefly, but I do need to go back to it a bit. It's in Supplemental Bundle, Tab 1. So in the same bundle, Tab 1, page 75. And I mean, I've already made some of the points. I mean, it's addressed to Mark Weiss Limited at, at, at its gallery in German Street. Uh, there's what you see is, uh, and what we've already seen, I don't need to go back to you again, you, you will recall I took you to the seller warranty. Yes. Uh, so Mark Weiss Limited, or you, whoever you is, is asked to warrant that it, it is the true owner or is properly authorised to sell the property by the true owner. So Sotheby's weren't actually asking, it, asking are you properly authorised by the owner to enter into this contract? It's only are you authorised to sell the property. Now, so that's the context. And if you work through it, um, the, you, what you see is frequently, uh, if you look through the various paragraphs, you have instructed Sotheby's. So the question is, who is you here? Is it intended to be Mark Weiss Limited, or is it intended to be Mark Weiss Limited and Fairlight? Or the owner. Or, or, or the owners. But it, in circumstances, well, no, you know it's not necessarily the owner. Not necessarily because of the warranty, which says you are the owner, or you are properly authorized to sell by the owner. So, so you might be the owner if, 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 for example, if Mark Weiss Limited was the sole owner, then you would be Mark Weiss Limited, both as the party to the contract and the owner of the property. But assume that this is a case, assume that Fairlight is the only owner, and it's absolutely abundantly clear that Fairlight have not authorised privity of contract with Sotheby's, but have authorised Mark Weiss to sell the property, then the warranty would still be satisfied. You would be Mark Weiss Limited, but the owner would be Fairlight. So the question is, then who is you? And we see repeated references to you this, you that. The, the, the only sensible interpretation here is that you is Mark Weiss Limited, because it's, address, it's a letter addressed to uh, Mark Weiss Limited. And indeed, um, some of the clauses are, are very difficult to, to read in any other way. So, For example, if you turn over the page, um, or page 76, and look at clause 6, it says, you have requested, and Sotheby's has agreed, that the property shall be held at your premises, set out above. Now, your, your premises, that can only be a reference to Mark Weiss Limited. It, it, because it, it's not Fairlight's premises. It's not the premises of any partnership between Fairlight and Mark Weiss Limited. And, and we've seen the email, the, the I must consult my partner email. So Sotheby's sort of knew there was somebody else in the background who had an interest here. But when you, when you construe this letter as a whole, the, the repeated references to you this and you that, and stored at your premises, it can o you can only be sensibly construed as a reference to Mark Weiss Limited, and only Mark Weiss Limited. And that, and that doesn't matter. It's not, it's, not a it's not a bad thing. It's not an unexpected thing. Because Mark Weiss Limited 
have warranted that they are authorized by the true owner to sell the painting. And that's all that Sotheby's need for their own protection. Because that means that Sotheby's know that they can sell the painting without risk of a claim for conversion. Or if there is a claim for con conversion, because it actually turns out the true owner is somebody completely different, they have a claim against Mark Weiss Limited. So as I say, it turns out that actually it's a looted work of art. And the true owner turns up and sues Sotheby's for conversion, which, which they can do, even though Sotheby's were completely innocent. They had no idea that this actually was, was stolen. Um, Sotheby's are liable to the true owner, but Sotheby's can sue Mark Weiss Limited because they weren't, in fact, authorized by the true owner. So that's all Sotheby's need for the protection. They don't need to have a contract directly with all of the owners of the property. All they need is a contract with a client that they know and trust, and we'll come on to another document that shows who they thought their client was here, coupled with a warranty from that client that they're authorized by the owner to sell. Why, why, is, why is it all they need? I mean, in this case, apparently, um, Mark Weiss Limited wasn't good for the money um, to buy the picture. Hmm. And so Sotheby's end up with a contract with a dealer, uh, whereas their real interests may very well be um, to uh, have, have a remedy against the person who actually owns the money. Well, they, they, they could have done that, because the warranty could have, could have been, uh, you warrant the authorized by the true owner to enter into this contract, or something of that sort. Or they could, as they actually knew. But they're still left with only, they're still left chasing Mr. Weiss. Well, they're left chasing Mark Weiss Limited, with, a, Mark Weiss Limited, with a guarantee from Mr. Mr. Weiss personally. Um, but I just, I, I, it may not beat us anywhere, mm. but I just didn't understand your point that Sotheby's got, got all they want. Well, they got all they, all they wanted, all they sought. Uh, of course, they, they, they might have wanted more, but if, if they had wanted more, they, they would have had to get it by saying, oh, we, we want to actually have a contract with the, with the true owner. It's not enough that you warrant yes. that you're yeah. authorized by the true owner. We actually want our contract to be with the true. So the counterfactual is that they come back and say, well, that's not enough. Get, mm. what, get a signature from Mr. Coates on the bottom. Mm. Or tell us who the true owner is. It may be that they, because there's no evidence, I think, that they, they knew Fairlight's existence. There was a reference to Mr. Kovitz. Yes. <coughs> and they could have said, well, who is the true owner? We want them to be party to this contract. But instead, all they want from all they've sought in their standard terms all they've sought from Mark Weiss Limited is a warranty that he is himself self it. It is itself authorized by the true owner to sell the goods. So what you don't see in this contract is any intention, when you look at it objectively, it doesn't matter what subjective you thought, any, when you look at this objectively, what you don't see is any intention by Sotheby's to enter into a contract with anyone other than Mark Weiss Limited. Well, is it, a, is, is it a, a, a proper question? I appreciate it's not the way the judge went, but is, is it a proper question? Well, if Mr. Coe has been asked to sign this, will he have signed it? Um, because if the, if, if, I mean, the judge's view of the situation was plainly <coughs> that um, Mr. Coe would have signed it because they'd, all, they'd agreed to sell that picture. And if that's what it took, um, he was going to sign it. Um, so is that a proper well, it's certainly not a proper question to ask me, um, <laughs> because it's not one I, well, not one that I can answer. Um, well, it's perfectly obvious it's looking at the documents. Is it where the, the, there was an agreement by them both that they were going to sell this picture, and it was, they weren't fussed about um, who was going to do what. It just was Mr. Weiss happened to be the person who was, who was dealing with it. Well, that's right. That's true in all of these subagents. The, 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 the owners of the vessels who want their insurance placed, placed in Lloyds are happy for their agents to appoint London brokers to, to, to do it. They consent. And, and, and the New Zealand or Australian uh, wheat grower, I can't remember whether it's New Zealand or Australia, who appoints agents, who then appoints sub-agents in London to sell, again, consents to that. But that's not enough to bring them into a contractual relationship with that sub-agent. So the fact that you were, that, that's the whole point of these authorities. They established that the fact that the principal consents, even agrees to the appointment of the sub-agent, is not enough. There needs to be some additional factor. And the reason they say we can't find it is here. Not only when you look at the evidence 
with Mr. Weiss in relation to what was actually discussed, and certainly in the context of the 17th of May email. You don't find it in that interaction, nor do you find it in contract A with Sotheby's, which construed objectively was a, co a contract with and only with Mark Weiss Limited. And then I, was, I said I was going to move on to another document. The next document is at, at page 71 in this bundle. This is the high value lot questionnaire, which is an internal Sotheby's document. You can see that from the very top of the page, private, privilege, and confidential internal Sotheby's document, high value lot questionnaire. Then halfway down the page, uh, we'll see this, so somebody at Sotheby's fills this out. Please take the full name and address of the consignor of the property. So the first point there is they're asking who's the con, they're not saying who's the owner, who's the consignor. So we come on to ownership. Is Mark Weiss Limited. If the consignor is an agent, please state the name and address of the persons for whom they're acting. And they just, for some reason, say not applicable. If the consignor is a corporation, please state the name and addresses of the beneficial owners. Okay, I'm not quite sure where they say not applicable, but it is a, it is a corporation. It's not a great start. It's not a, it's not a great start. <laughs> this, this, this is their own internal document. So, um, it right, is we the owner. We'll this in, we? Oh, sorry. We, yes, we do. You see the answers under, underneath. Is the owner and or agent, and this is the document disclosed by Sotheby's in, in, in context of these proceedings. Is, is, I assume if there was a better one, we would have that as well. Is the owner and or agent a new client? No. If so, do you, uh, have you had all the required identification entered onto the client system? Not applicable. If the client is an existing client, please state the account number and confirm that the account is in good standing. There is an account number, which I assume is that of Mark Weiss Limited, mm. um, because, because Mark Weiss Limited has been identified as the consignor and account in good standing. We don't see any, if they considered that actually Fairlight was another client for the purposes of this transaction, then Fairlight should have been identified in some way as well, either as a new client or as a client that already had an account with Sotheby's. So their internal documents are entirely inconsistent, sorry, in, in, are entirely consistent, are entirely consistent with contract A, which we've just looked at, at, at indicating an intention to contract with Mark Weiss Limited and Mark Weiss Limited only with on the basis that Mark Weiss Limited are prepared to warrant that they are authorized to sell the painting by the owner. So, uh, my Lord, if we put that bundle away and turn back to the judgment, Before I forget, um, is there any relevant passage in the cross-examination of Mr. Kovitz which we ought to look at in relation to any of this? Or? There, there was none that I was planning to take you to. Okay. I, don't, I don't know whether my learned friend is, and, and I will consider that further. Um, yes, no, I just wanted to right. check that, the, you know, that there was not something we should have been looking at that happened on that front. I mean, it may be the answer, we, whatever they may have contemplated or discussed between themselves, that's not going to help in finding the requisite objective intention on the part of Sotheby's. Quite. So, so we were looking um, at paragraph 21. And I was, I was taking you uh, to the evidence. And then that feeds into uh, paragraph 22. It says, I'm fully satisfied that this episode gave NMW authority for Fairlight to enter into contract A on their joint behalf. I don't accept the construct argued by Fairlight and Fairlight for simply giving MW authority to enter an agreement between MW and Sotheby's. Having heard and read the evidence of Mr. Cowitz and read the evidence of Mr. Weiss and considered the engagement of Sotheby's, in my judgment, the structure of the relationship between them for which Fairlight contends is unrealistically narrow. Um, in my judgment, the authorities cited on the sub-agency do not engage. Facts do not support the idea of Sotheby's with a sub-agent. Um, so, the, 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 the two major problems with this paragraph. First, it's wholly unclear what it is. Apart from, he says, he says the, the, I am satisfied by this episode, appears to be a reference just back to paragraph 21. And we've already looked at that. 
He says, I'm satisfied by this episode. And then he draws his conclusion. It's, it's wholly unclear what, what other evidence. He, I mean, he refers to having read and heard the evidence. It's wholly unclear what it is that has satisfied him that this is a case where there was privity between, the, uh, between Fairlight and Sotheby's. Um, the only evidence he expressly refers to is that in paragraph 21. And as I've already said, that is, that is not sufficient to establish privity. Uh, and secondly, this is the point, the point a bit earlier. We say this is a paragraph where, rather than applying the law in order to arrive at a conclusion, he has asserted a conclusion, i.e. there was privity, in order to disapply the law. What he should have done is applied the authorities. There were no, in, in, in this case, although Fairlight appointed um, Mark Weiss Limited as the agent, and Mark Weiss Limited appointed Sotheby's as an agent. It's not, an, it's not a sub-agency. There's a direct relationship for these reasons. There's no, there's no analysis of that sort at all. Um, so, anyway, we've been, I've, I've looked through the, the only evidence that I want to refer you to for now. Uh, then moving on to paragraph 23. Uh, he says, it was by contract A that the owners of the painting bound themselves as principal to the sale. So just pausing there, uh, my Lord's Malay, that sentence is simply wrong. Contract A did not bind the owners to any sale. What contract A did was grant authority to Sotheby's for, author for Sotheby's to sell. Well, that, that may, I mean, clearly, that is, you're, yeah. you're right, it's a matter of what contract A did, but does that matter? Well, it, it, it just could be, I don't mean this impolitely, just loose language. Well, if, if it is, but it, 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 the, 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 the actual analysis of this issue is, is, is quite short. Um, I mean, it, it's less than a page, a page of actual analysis of the issues that go. But let's, so let's I'm say, assuming that every. Let's say consignment agreement. What do you mean? I mean, I would say contract A certainly um, w granted Sotheby's authority to bind the owners as principals to the sale. If that's what it said, that would be accurate. Um, but because what, what bound the owners to the sale was Sotheby's as agent, in fact, concluding contract B with Nevada. Mm. Now, the second sentence, the private treaty terms incorporating contract A saw Sotheby's agree to give the authenticity guarantee. Up, up, up to that point, uh, that is accurate. It then says, in its own right, committing its own balance sheet. Actually, the authenticity guarantee says that the owners will refund the purchase price, but we don't need to dwell on that. The, um, but it, none of this, we say, is sufficient to result in the disapplication of the general rule that we say you find in the authorities to which we have referred. And certainly the fact that they have, they incur a personal liability is not sufficient, because that's exactly the facts of Prentice Donegan. Because in Prentice Donegan, the London agents incur a liability because it's marine insurance. The London agents have a liability to the underwriters to pay, to pay the insurance premium. And so they paid the insurance premium, they incurred a personal liability, and uh, Mr. Justice Rick says, well, they can't recover that from the principal because their only contractual relationship is with the London broker. So they actually recover that from the London broker. So the only point I make there is the fact that Sotheby's might incur uh, personal um, liabilities in the context of this performing its duties as agent is not sufficient to disapply the general rule. Uh, indeed, agents will frequently incur liabilities or acquire rights as part of what they're doing, if, even, if it's only a, even if the only right is the right to uh, earn a commission. So actually, the, the analogy, you can see the more you look at it, the analogy between this case and Prentice Donegan is actually very strong. 
So moving on to uh, paragraph 24. Fairlight pays reliance on internal Sotheby's email from Mr. James McDonald's to various employees in which Mr. McDonald used language of an agreement to sell the house privately from Mark Weiss with no mention of the sale being for Fairlight 2. I do not find this persuasive. The email is not a legal document. Its imprecision is in fact illustrated by the reference to Mark Weiss rather than Mark Weiss Limited. Now, um, so the judge dismisses this on the basis that it's not a legal document. And I accept that words used in an informal context must carry less weight than words used in a legal document. But that's not the point, because the words do at least give some indication of who Sotheby's thought they were dealing with. And more importantly, in this case, it's no good saying, well, I'm going to disregard what that email says because it's not a legal document. We, in fact, have a legal document, and that is the contract A, which says who you're dealing with. So, so this is a case where the contract A says the contract's with Mark Weiss Limited. The internal document refers to Mark Weiss, admittedly Mark Weiss rather than Mark Weiss, Weiss Limited. But that is consistent with the express terms of contract A. So, well, we say that for those reasons, there was no privity. I'm reduced to five points. Uh, the, the position is as follows. First, where there is a chain of authority, such as that in the present case, the starting point and the general rule is that there is no privity between the principal and the subagent. The second point, the fact that the principal expressly or impliedly authorized the engagement of the subagent is not sufficient to establish privity of contract between the, privity, uh, between the principal and the subagent. Third, the exception to the general rule is narrow, and the burden of establishing that the exception applies falls on the party alleging it. Uh, and the authority for that? Uh, that is uh, Francis uh, Donegan. I'll try and fish out a more, I'll, I'll try and get you the exact reference um, for tomorrow. Forgive me, you've already taken us to it already, and I've just lost it. Well, actually, I did skip over the authorities r rightly, given the time pressures rather more quickly than I was going to, so I haven't been to every passage that I, that feeds into these conclusions. Uh, and then, so the fourth point is that in order to discharge the burden, the party alleging, I, th I, mean, I think it's the Prentice Donegan passage I, I did take you to, but I'll, I'll check that. In order to discharge the burden, the party alleging privity must point to some special factor. And these might be direct relations between the principal and the subagent, or evidence that the agent's sole responsibility was to introduce the subagent, or evidence that the subagent completely replaced the agent, why there was a substitution rather than a delegation or subcontract. And the fifth point is we say no such factors are present in this case. It's, it's a standard case. Fairlight authorized MWL to sell the painting, and then MWL, with Fairlight's agreement, then authorized Sotheby's to do so in specified terms. I mean, all of these propositions are, are contingent on something that the judge didn't agree with, which wasn't a principal agent, sub-agent situation. Well, I mean, that, that's the, um, that, that's where, where your submission and his yep. judgment part company. But, but I mean, if you're if you're right um, with its principal agent sub agent, then all of your five points may then follow. But um, paragraph in paragraph twenty three, he simply didn't accept that account of the contractual setup. But well, that's why I say he, he, that's where I say he went wrong. He, he reached his conclusion in order to disapply the law, rather than looking at the law in order to reach the conclusion. Because on any view, Fairlight had no dealings with Sotheby's. Or it's, if it was brought into privity with Sotheby's, it was through Mark Weiss Limited. And we've seen. Yes, but you've you had a discussion with my lady earlier, mm -hmm. earlier on about um, agency. But if, yeah. if you have um, joint owners of property mm -hmm. and one speaks on behalf of both, how is that properly to be considered with, with the full fanfare of? Um, Prentice Donegan agency between the commercial organisations work across the world and so forth. I mean, it's a completely different situation, possibly. Um, not, that doesn't answer whether the judge was right or not, but I mean, he, 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 he cuts off your five points at the knee before you even get to, to building them by saying it wasn't that sort of situation at all. I agree it's different where you have co-owner. That's why I used 
take an extreme example where it assumed Fairlight's the 100% owner, and then it goes to Mark Weiss and says, please sell it, and Mark Weiss goes to Sotheby's. Then, then that would be a more classic, simple, straightforward example of the... Yes, but actually the, the, that's right, but, but actually the situation of co-owners is, in a sense, a peculiar one, yeah. because they're particularly bound together. Mm. And so the fact that one of them speaks on behalf of both is neither... You know, one could envisage domestic instances um, in which two people living in a house together, one of them deals with the electric. Um, uh, yeah. And one wouldn't say, you know, my housemate was my agent for dealing with the electricity company. Well, it, it's normally whoever signs the contract with the electricity company will be the one that's liable, whether or not they can recover anything from their housemates up to their... Yes, well, I, their, my fault, don't let's get into that. But, um, <laughs> But I mean, the, but, I, I was just trying to establish yeah. that your five points are, 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 are only only begin to take off uh, once you've dispatched the judge's primary conclusion. Well, well, well that sort of situation. Isn't well, it? no, because but there is definitely a chain of authority because uh, Fairlight had no direct dealings with Sotheby's at all, so it can only be bought into privity with Sotheby's through Mark Weiss Limited. So Mark Mark Weiss Limited is undoubtedly performing an agency function of some sort or another for Fairlight. The question is, what is its agency function? Was it an agent to sell, or was it an agent for the purposes of bringing Sotheby's into privity of contract with um, Fairlight? So, so there is undoubtedly a chain. So that's why I say you can't just... So privity of contract with Fairlight and, and, and MWL. Yes. Now, I accept it's, it's more com it's, it, it, it's superficially at least it's more complicated with co-owners because MWL is also a principle, but but co-owners are it, you, as a matter of legal analysis when one co-owner acts on behalf of both of them it acts as principal and as agent for the other co-owner that's the only way it can bind the other co-owner. So that's. Um, that's why we say you can't just ignore the authorities. The authorities have to be applied in order to decide whether or not there is privity. Now, it may be the sort of issues that your Lordship's mentioned are reasons why you say, well, the general rule doesn't apply here. Be because, actually, although the original agreement evidenced by the 17th of May email was, uh, was giving Mark Weiss limited authority to sell, actually, there was subsequent in agreement between Mark Rice Limited and Fairlight, that Mark Rice Limited would conclude a contract as principal and agent so as to bind Fairlight to the contract with Sotheby's. But, that, but you have to find some factor that leads you to that conclusion. So otherwise, you're just left with a chain of authority. Fairlight authorizes Mark Rice, Mark Rice authorizes Sotheby's, Sotheby's concludes the contract with the third party. So that, that's why we say you can't just ignore the authorities where there is, in fact, a chain. I don't think the judge ignored the authorities. He cites them on the very same page, mm. at least some of them. Um, uh, your, I mean, your complaint is he doesn't sufficiently grapple with um, yeah. the distinction. Because I, I, it's not a matter of saying they don't apply. It's applying them. And, but you apply them, and the conclusion can, in, in, in certain situations, you apply the authorities, and the conclusion is there is privity of contract. So is this a reasons complaint, or is it, or, 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 or is it, um, well, it that the well, judge was not, could not have found um, Well, it, it's, of it's reasons, because the reason, you, you really can't tell how he's reached this conclusion. It's just an assertion. Uh, but it's also, we say, he's plainly wrong. If you actually look at the material. No, but he was bound to find, I beg your pardon, he was bound to find yeah. um, that um, privity did not yeah. exist. No, no, no reasonable judge no reasonable found judge. otherwise. Uh, yeah. That was the classic modern formulation. Yes, yeah. because nowhere do you find any of the special factors that are required to lead to the conclusion that there was privity. We're going to back to my Lord and Peter Jackson's point. Mm. You do need to get over the hurdle, the authorities to engage, that there was a, an agency and a sub-agency of the type contemplated in those authorities before the five points flow. So there is a chain of authority, clearly, mm. that you need to establish the to engage the sub-agency authorities in their fullest sense in order for those five propositions to flow. Yes, so what I need to do is establish that 
Mark Weiss Limited was appointed as an agent to sell. But there was a main agency, yeah. a head agency, on the 17th of May. Yes. Followed by a sub agency within that. Yes. Mm. And, and I accept an authorised sub agency, but that's, that doesn't yeah, alter the analysis. Yeah. I agree that if the original agent, you could still have a, you could have a chain where these authorities aren't engaged. For example, if the if it had, well, except the authorities are still engaged, but they tell you that the answer is the opposite. If the 17th of May email had said, go and appoint Sotheby's uh, on behalf of both of us, and that was the limit of Mark Weiss's role, then the answer would be there's privity of contract between Sotheby's and Fairlight. But that, that's, not, say, that's not because these authorities don't apply. That's the actual result you get when you apply the authorities. Because in Prentice Donegan, they use that as an example of a, of a factor that will result in privity of contract. What is the factor? Between. Which it, factor is it? Yeah, so the, if, if the limit it's of... The limit of the authority. If the, limit, the limit of the authority. head agent's role... Yeah. I'll, I'll actually I'll get the... Um, to make sure I don't misquote it. The sole responsibility is to... Is to appoint the, the yeah. sub-agent. Yeah, 332. Um, Thank you. But yes, the defendant's sole responsibility to the principal was to procure a competent agent. And there it's offshore and broker, but... So if that was Mark Weiss's sole function, then 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 the result would be different. But it's not because you dis it's not because you don't apply the authorities or you ignore them. That is the result of applying them. Well, what what greater responsibility did Mark Weiss have here? Well, you can see from the original email of the seventeenth of May that the um, the authority was to sell the painting not just to introduce Sotheby's. But, but then we move on in time, anyway. We'll yes, well, well, hyper, well let, and let, you can explore that. So the Sotheby's, contract A gave them three months to secure this sale. Uh, if they had not secured the sale, you would have been back to the position where Mark Weiss Limited would be still trying to market it to his own clients and other people. I'm sorry, is this, let me just think that I have a moment. I mean, if, if the original authority had been go to Sotheby's and arrange a, a sale on behalf of both mm -hmm. of us. And then supposing that, as in fact happened, it was only Mark Wise who went to Sotheby's and he didn't tell them anything at all about the involvement of, um, of Fairlight in the transaction. That would You'd still have a situation where Fairlight was bound. But that would be as an undisclosed principle. Yeah, you'd apply a normal yeah, agency yeah. principles there. So the mere fact that the co contract A doesn't make any reference to Fairlight is not in itself conclusive, because you could have a situation of an undisclosed principle. That, yes, that, that is not on itself determinative of the issue. Okay, I think that's a point I needed to carry about myself. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that what the judge in, in fact found without using those words? Well. Um, <laughs> well, um, if he did, I'm not sure where that that finding is is not express. expressed. So, I mean, that's so no, I don't. What 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 what, what alternative would there be to this? Well, this, 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 I mean, this is the problem. You can't actually, based on this judgment, you can't actually understand how he's reached the conclusion that he's reached. No, this was about what conclusion he reached. Well, and you're not even entirely aware well, you're, you're right. <laughs> not into, I mean, he obviously has reached the conclusion that there is privity of contract. Yes. Um, but but what, what other alternative than undisclosed principle would there be for that conclusion? Well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there would be one. But if well, that's the are. basis, so, I mean, that, if that's the basis of the judgment, then that should be spelt out. You can't, you can't just leave it to the parties to try and work out. Or, or you can't fill the gaps. It may, it may be that, I mean, that it, that looking at the judgment, you might say, well, no, he's, based on the, his reasoning, he's just got it wrong. They, if, if there is some other alternative basis to justify the conclusion that a judge has reached, then that needs to be spelt out in the judgment. We can't sit here and guess 
what was what was in his mind when he wrote this. Um, so we say, not only do we tack this for, again, on grounds of inadequate reasoning, but also on the, on the basis that it's plainly wrong. And, he, and, it, and he's misdirected himself, because, again, it's back to the same point. You apply the authorities to get to the result, whether that's privity or not, rather than simply asserting the conclusion and using that to, to push them to one side. So briefly then, I said I was going to say a couple of words about Sotheby's skeleton. Um, I will shorten this as given uh, the time. Um, bear with me one second. I will, actually, I will, I, I will deal with, I'll just deal with one, one paragraph of that skeleton. Uh, if you could take that out, it's paragraph 19, uh, page 146. So paragraph 19 says, first, Fairlight accepts that by contract A and contract B together, A, its title in the painting passed to the buyer, and B, it received its share of the purchase price of 10.75 million. Fairlight nevertheless claims that it was party to neither contract A nor contract B. That leaves the crucial question unanswered. How and on what terms did Fairlight pass its share in the painting to the buyer? Well, well, also, every single one of those sentences is wrong. Um, taking the first one, it was common ground on the pleadings that title passed pursuant to contract B. That's the sale contract, not contract A and B. As regards the second sentence, Fairlight did not claim that it was party to neither contract. It denied that it was party to contract A, but accepted that it was party to contract B. And as a result, this is the third sentence, no critical question was left unanswered. Indeed, there's no question of this sort at all. What's the title passed under contract B? Yes, the sale contract. Sorry, how do you, how do you get to be a party to contract B but not to contract A? Well, the same way in all these sub-agency cases. The sub-agent mm -hmm. can bind the principal even though it's not in a direct contractual relationship with it, because you have the chain of authority that works its way down. And, and that's, that's true in all, in all of these cases. And, and I took you to one passage that says, well, in all sub-agency cases, you end up with a contract between the principal and the ultimate third party, but it doesn't mean there's privity with the sub-agent. And if I can just take you to the pleading, because what, what's said here is Fairlight accepts and Fairlight claims these things. But if you look at the pleadings, it's simply not right. So if we look at the particulars of claim, in the appeal bundle, tab 14, page 173. Starting on paragraph four, this is dealing with, it's, it's here called the seller contract. This is contract A. By an agreement signed by Sotheby's and Mark Weiss, Mark Weiss, on its own behalf and on behalf of Fairlight, and then there's the reference to the partnership, agreed to grant Sotheby's for a period of three months the exclusive right to offer and sell on behalf of the defendants the Franz House. That's what's said about contract A. Then over on to page, paragraph 7 on page 175. Pursuant to contract A, that's the set of contract, by an agreement signed by Sotheby's and Nevada. What page? Uh, page 175. We're now looking at paragraph 7. Mm -hmm. So pursuant to contract A, by an agreement signed by Sotheby's in Nevada, contract B, then subpara A, the defendants acting by Sotheby's as their agent, agreed to sell, and the buyer agreed to purchase the property for a price of, and it gives the price, which after the commission comes down to the 10, that comes down to 10.75. Then paragraph eight, pursuant to clause one and two of the buyer contract, that's contract, contract B, not, not, not pursuant to A and B, pursuant to one and two of the contract B, in two installments, uh, Sotheby's was paid the purchase price on behalf of the buyer and title in the property passed to the buyer. So that's their pleading. So it's clear that actually Sotheby's are saying, actually, title passed pursuant to contract B, not A and B. And we then look at Fairlight's defense at tab 16, 
And if we can turn in that to page 221. Uh, 19 and 19a says that the true relationship is the principal and sub-agent, and that accordingly there was never any privity of contract between them. So there you have Fairlight saying there is no privity with Sotheby's, so it's not party to contract A. But over the page on 222 at paragraph 22, as to paragraph 7 of the we re-amended dictate of the claim, it denied that Sotheby's acted on its own behalf when providing the buyer with a guarantee. It is averred that Sotheby's was acting as agent and sub-agent on behalf of MWL and Fairlight, respectively, when it provided the guarantee. Same as aforesaid, paragraph 7 of the re-re-amended particulars of claim is admitted. Paragraphs 8 and 9 of the re-re-amended particulars of claim are admitted. So what you see there is Fairlight accepting that Sotheby's was acting as its sub-agent when it concluded contract B, and admitting that title passed pursuant to contract B. And indeed, I, I won't do it, but the judgment at paragraph 7, 2 and 7, 3 also confirmed that it was common ground uh, that, well, I, I'll make sure I get it right so I don't misquote it. Seven, so the, in the common ground, 7.2 concerns the appointment of Sotheby's and giving it the right to offer and sell the painting. In 7.3, is contract A, Sotheby's identified a buyer, that buyer Nevada and Sotheby's signed contract B, which was the, which was the contract of sale by which and contained the terms on which the seller of the painting, acting by Sotheby's as their agent, agreed to sell the painting to the buyer for the purchase price specified. So I've just... So turning back to paragraph 19 of the skeleton and the heading that's immediately above it, which is title in the painting passed by contract A, um, we say that, is, is, that part of the skeleton is just plainly wrong. The correct analysis is contract A was part of the chain by which Sotheby's acquired its authority as agent to sell the painting. Contract B was the contract of sale pursuant to which title passed from the sellers to the buyer. Well, I'll skip over the, the, the other points, but I'm conscious of the time, and I do want to say something briefly about the GAV clause. So, well, as so far as the GAV clause is concerned, um, this issue arises, you, you would have seen that the guarantee in contract B, which is the contract of sale, provided that there was no right to rescind, there would be no rescission, um, if the description of the painting accorded with the generally accepted views and schol of scholars uh, and experts. <coughs> and, well, also, maybe if we do have it uh, to hand so we don't put the language wrong. I know, I know it appears in more than one place. I've been using the bundle, supplemental bundle tab one. And you referred it to us this morning. I'm not really sure. I, we I did. To. Okay, well, I don't need to go back. So we say if essentially that clause operates to allocate risk in the event that the painting is subsequently found to be a counterfeit. Yes. Um, if the description does accord with generally accepted views of scholars and experts, then the buyer bears the risk. If the description indicates there's a divergence of views, the buyer bears the risk. It's only if the description is inconsistent with a generally accepted view, or there is a proper divergence which isn't referred to in the description, that the risk falls on the seller. Now, we say in determining whether or not the description does accord with the generally accepted views of scholars and experts, that the court is required to perform what is essentially a fairly, a fairly mechanical exercise. So in relation to any, the, the parties will no doubt name people who they say are relevant scholars and experts. So the first question for the court is, is that person a relevant scholar or expert? In other words, are, do they have specialist knowledge of the work of, of, of Franz Hals? So that's a yes, no answer. And they can whittle down the individuals until they've identified the relevant scholars and experts. Second question is, has that person expressed a view? 
Well, obviously, if they have, what is that? And once that's been done for all of the identified individuals, the next question is whether those views are generally in agreement, such that it can be said that there is a body of generally accepted views. And we say the clause plainly does not require unanimous agreement between the scholars and experts. The, the real issue we're grappling with is how much disagreement can there be before it's said that one group of views are no longer uh, generally accepted, uh, uh, generally accepted views. And we say that question is answered by looking at the whole clause. If the views have been expressed by a number of scholars and experts, the clause only anticipates two scenarios. There's, there either is a generally accepted view, it is house or it isn't, or there's a divergence of views. The use of the word generally makes it clear that complete unanimity is not required. There is room for some dissent. And the phrase divergence of views is also consistent with this. We say there must be sufficient support for an opposing view in order to create a divergence. A single lone voice isn't enough to say there's a divergence of views. So surely everything depends on who the lone voice belongs to. This is in the present case, it's one of the three leading experts in the field. And he's absolutely clear on the point. And this is a newly discovered painting which has no proper provenance, hasn't been published, and has never been in an exhibition. How on earth can you say it was a generally accepted view? Well, because, because he was a lone voice, and that, that's why. And Sorry, because? Because he was a lone voice. And because Sotheby say, well, we consulted the right experts, and all the other experts are saying he's wrong. I must say I'm very puzzled by the thought that it's a headcount exercise. That seems to me a wholly inappropriate mechanical approach to a sort of connoisseurial exercise of this kind. Well, it's mechanical only in this sense. I mean, in, in this sense, you, you, the first question you have to ask is, is the person a scholar or an expert? Yeah. And that will whittle it down generally to a, a, a fairly limited number of individuals. Then the next, which is, that is, in a sense, I mean, obviously it's not mechanical. There, there might be individuals where there's a fine decision to be made. But ultimately, the answer is yes or no. And it's only if the answer is yes that you then take their views into account. I don't understand why you approach it in that way at all. I see that that's what happened. For good management, maybe you do have to do this. But surely, um, some, some people are um, experts at a certain level. Other people are experts at another level. And some people are super experts. Mm -hmm. And you look at the whole field. Um, within the practicalities of litigation and to ask yourself the question, is it generally accepted that this is a house? I mean, I, I appreciate you, your offering, I think mechanical probably does, does you down. Um, it's a, a structured approach yeah. to this, which I the that judge would wish to, to, <laughs> to, to, to adopt. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you, 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 it's not absolutely necessary to say, well, that person gets the badge of being an expert, and that person is cast into outer darkness. Uh, you look at the range of um, scholarly and academic opinion, and you then ask yourself, is it generally accepted? And you're right, the fact that somebody, however eminent, says no is not the end of it or the matter. But as my Lord says, it might count for rather a lot if he's absolutely at the top rank. Yeah, and, and then what you do is you look at, the, because if, Obviously, if, you, if the experts, if, if all the experts share a view, then it's very easy. If, if there is a sort of a very obvious divergence, so you, you've identified nine experts, five say yes, four say no, then you very clearly say, well, there's a divergence of views. The, the, the question is, where, where, where do you cross the line? And, and, and what, if, what if one expert expresses a view based on a forwarded email with a JPEG? Another expert expresses a view having um, lived with the painting um, next, slept next to it for a couple of weeks. Well, the, the, the point I make there is, I mean, if an expert, you obviously look at what, what is the view expressed by the expert. If the expert is saying, this is a Franz Hals, then the expert, relying on their own expertise, has satisfied themselves. Now, whether they do that by looking at examining the painting for an extended period, or whether they feel able to do that on the basis of a, of a photograph. That's really a matter for the expert, not for the court to say, well, actually, as you, I'm going to disregard your view because you've only looked at a photograph. Because if you have the, the generally accepted view, 
might be based entirely on people who have only looked at photographs. And then one person says, well, I've looked at the painting. I don't think it is a Franz Hals. And all the other experts say, well, we think you're wrong. You'd still say the generally accepted view is that it is a Franz Hals. Does it, does it matter that it's um, just arrived with a um, thin provenance and no scientific testing? Well, the, the, the scientific testing is a, is, a, is, a, is a different point altogether because it, it, the, the generally accepted view is should this be attributed to France? I understand that, to but France. If, if, in considering if you've got a divergence of views, as there was in this case, mm. wherever the majority lay, the fact that it was a newcomer to the, um, the House mm. collection um, and that the test that was subsequently carried out had not yet been carried out, does, is that not something the court can take into account in well, deciding whether it's generally accepted? Well, actually, the, the, the testing wouldn't have actually helped resolve the um, dispute between Professor Grimm and all the other experts. No, but it might have done. Supposing a dendrochronological analysis showed that the panel on which it was painted comes from a tree felled in the 18th century, and that would be the end of the case. Well, well you know, except the, the divergence of views, if there was between Professor Grimm and uh, the other experts, he wasn't saying this is a modern forgery. He was just saying it's not Franz House. It's by someone in his studio or something like that. So actually, uh, the, 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 uh, and. Yes, Professor Grimm would have seen the scientific stuff and said, well, I'm wrong about that. And it's, it's even more not. Oh, Franz yeah. House. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Later. Later. <laughs> yes, no, I, I, I accept that point. I'm mean, absolutely. I wasn't referring to the, what the mm. results were. I was referring mm. to the fact that there weren't any yeah. at the time. But you could still have, I mean, and you still will have a generally accepted view without scientific testing to data painting. Well, there may be a question whether you can have such a thing as a generally accepted view before the painting in question has been exposed for a reasonably lengthy period to scholarship, exhibition, discussion, and all the rest of it. Which is, which is why it's perhaps important to, to pick up on the point that here it talks about rather than a generally accepted view. The, the, the question is, is this in accordance with generally accepted views of plural or of mm. scholars and experts? Which we say points you again to looking at what do the scholars and experts say? And if all bar one have expressed a view, or at least ones, I mean, we, we find that the, the eventual table, we deal with, I deal with this in more detail in, in the skeleton argument, but it gets you to uh, the table that you find on uh, page 21, where you have it's broken down uh, into the three that individuals who had seen the painting. Uh, and there's one bit of judgment where the, the judge said, I think it was Mr. Mr. Happen. The, 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 the only evidence was the effect that he had seen it. So the evidence supports all three of these individuals having seen the painting. Sorry, it's page 124 using the yes, London yes. yes. And of, of just to help you to separate, well, we can ignore the right-hand column for now, because that's after, after the relevant date. It's the left-hand column and the middle column. Um, the, the ticks, as you can see, indicate people who had indicated pos positive attribution. The, to separate them from scholars and experts, uh, Dr. Boyce Boer is a scholar, Professor Slive is a scholar, and Professor Grimm is a scholar, whereas the other four individuals named in those um, two, uh, we, we, we say, were experts. The um, one uh, disagreement with the judge, and we've dealt with this in, in our skeleton some length, so taking into account the time, I don't need to go through this again. Is, is whether or not the evidence is sufficient that Professor Sly have expressed an opinion. And, and we say it is for the reasons given in our judgment. There was also um, uh, one issue in relation to uh, it's Mr. Bouvelot, in fact, who we put in the first column. The judgment at paragraph 67 says that he's not persuaded by the evidence that Mr. Bouvelot had, in fact, seen the painting. Again, there's no indication of what evidence um, he's referring to, because the evidence of Mr. Weiss was that Mr. Bouvelot had 
in fact seen the painting. Um, um, I'm sorry, sorry. But with, with a night of the, the time, mm. can, can I just understand a bigger point, which is paragraph 62, which is where the judge sets out his yeah. approach to, um, to this question. I just want to understand, it's on page, page 82, um, just want to understand what you say is wrong with it, because mm. either we're dealing with a misdirection yeah. um, or with a perverse weighing of the evidence or, 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 um, or both. If you were to succeed on this point. So what, what's wrong with paragraph 62? Well, the, the error in paragraph 62 uh, is, is that he has, rather than simply applying the words generally accepted views of scholars of experts, he, he, I mean, he says um, uh, the words require a, a, a generally accepted opinion has been reached. So he's changed it from rather than looking at the views of scholars and experts to, to identify what, which body of views represents those the, uh, the generally accepted one. He is required, as he says, we look at it and try and find a uniform, generally accepted opinion. So he's but, but that is what, on, your, on the facts here, you can see, understand why he's done that, because you say there was a single view. So on the facts of this case, that's why he's done that, because you're saying there was a single, almost unanimous view that this was and there was a single view to the contrary. So I think maybe that's why he said what he did. Um, and what, picking up my Lord's point, what's wrong with uh, the conclusion that the views that are material are views that are considered? Well, Because quite a lot is made against you, and again, yeah. this is further down the line on, on the facts, but some of the views are indirect, the now man thing, um, or fleeting well, comments that would fall potentially far short of a considered view. Well, it, yeah, I, I agree. It, it has to be a properly expressed view as to the attribution of the painting. Um, but, but what you can't is say, oh, well, because that expert hadn't actually seen the painting in the flesh, I'm going to disregard that expert's view. Because the expert may, in fact, after careful examination of photographs and other documents, form a view, or quite properly form a view, that it is properly attributed to Hulse. Mm. Now, so far as uh, the, the, the train example that you, you just gave, now the question there is, um, w w w if, if, if it was suggested that the view was formed solely on the basis of a conversation that took place while somebody was on a train, I think you would say that's obviously not a properly expressed view. But the fact that the person is on a train when he communicates his view about the attribution of a painting to somebody <coughs> else doesn't mean it's not a properly informed view. I still, I still haven't mm. understood what your complaint is about paragraph 62. I know you don't like the, um, mm. the way the judge then went about his task, but what's wrong with 62? In a, in a, a word, as it were. Well, so well, two words. One, he changes it from looking at the generally accepted views into a, trying right, to, so to a search to, for a one single. Has to decide whether that's material. Or not. Yep. Uh, and and then the, I mean, views that are considered. I, I, I don't oppose that at all. But it's what I what what I what I disagree with is the step he's then taken, which is to say, well, when people have said it is by house and they've looked at a photograph, I'm going to ignore it. If they say it isn't by house and they've looked at a photograph, I'm going to accept it. Yeah, but in, this, in the end, doesn't this just boil down, and it may be a good ground of appeal, um, mm. but doesn't it just boil down to a, a critique of the judge's handling of the evidence? Yes, it does. And then we dealt with the evidence. But it's not it's really about the, about the standard that he set. Um, it's, it's about how he went about well, we, the task. It's, 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 it's large that. And as I said, we do... We do uh, object to the way in which he's, he's changed the language, but it's largely about his, 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 his conclusion is, well, we say his conclusion is, because one expert, uh, we accept he's an expert, or one scholar, sorry, I should get that right, because one scholar has um, put forward another view, therefore that is sufficient for me to find that there wasn't a, there, there were not, there wasn't a body of generally accepted views. I mean, so much depends on the scholar, supposing that in the counterfactual world, everyone had been in favour except for 
Professor Seymour Snipe, who everybody mm. agrees was the preeminent expert at any rate mm. um, earlier in his life when he produced the first edition of his monograph. Um, and supposing he had been the lone voice saying this is not genuine, and he backed that up with plenty of scholarship and had included it in his catalogue raisonné with chapter and verse. Now surely that would count for very much just given his own preeminent status in the field and would have been enough alone to say there wasn't a generally accepted view because by far the most influential scholar in the field was against it. Unless what you see is all the other scholars in the field saying he's wrong. Well, of course, they, if, they, if they engage with his opinion and give reasons for disagreeing with it, that's another matter. But I mean, that is what's conspicuously absent in a case like this, where you have a newly emerged painting which has absolutely no history, has left no trace in the literature anywhere, has never been exhibited, um, and must set all kinds of alarm bells ringing when it appears out of nowhere with a very incomplete provenance and with a suspiciously convenient monogram in the bottom right-hand corner, um, and so on. Yeah, but, but the, the point is here, when you look at the evidence, I mean, you, have, you see all of the other experts saying, insofar as they comment, Slive has seen it and approved it, and he's right. Grimm says it's not by House, and he's wrong. And this isn't something that Sotheby's just overlooked, because we, we had evidence from Clarissa Post, who explained that Sotheby's were aware of the Grimm opinion. They considered it. They discussed it with Mr. Hedrin, the principal behind Nevada. And, and, and it was after this sort of process. Because I accept Sotheby's, we don't look to Sotheby's as being an expert or a scholar for the purposes of attribution. But, but what they are expert at is looking at identifying the experts and scholars, weighing up the different views that have been expressed, and then deciding whether or not this should be described as a house, or whether it should be pointed out in the description that there's a divergence of use. So that's why we rely additionally on the, ro on a, the role of I mean, it, it, Don't let's go any further into this, but um, it's that the property description accords with generally accepted views of scholars and experts. Mm. I suppose one might read generally accepted views of scholars and experts means views generally accepted by scholars and experts? I and mean, who is the person who is generally accepting these views? It, it must be other scholars and experts. Yeah. And that's why you look for what the others, what scholars and experts have said about the views expressed by others. And so Nauman, for example, says, Sly Bright, they refer to the grim opinion. It's one of the phrases used to describe as the grim's view. And you see them variously saying he's wrong. Um, so, but anyway, that, that, that's probably all I should say about that. The, um, just very, very quickly, it is, it is actually a very, a very short point. Um, the original purchaser point. Yeah. Um, the, 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 this is a, I mean, a short point of, of construction. Uh, and it arises because this, the original purchaser language is found not in contract B, which is the contract of sale, but in contract A. But the reason why it's relevant is that Sotheby's claim in uh, this action is to recover sums that they say are due under contract A. And contract A provides that, sets out the terms uh, that control or should have controlled rescission of the contract. And that included a language that the guarantee will not be assignable and will only be applicable to the original buyer and not to any subsequent owner or owners who, require, who acquire an interest in the property. So if I can just illustrate the reason why it's significant. This appears in contract A, not in contract B. Sorry, can you just remind me where in contract A we find that language? Uh, Yes, uh, so contract A is supplemented bundle, tab yes. one starting at page sorry, 75, it. and it's in the private treaty terms. I'm sorry, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's in the, uh, the, the private treaty terms. Oh, in the private treaty terms, oh, sorry. sorry, thank you. Yes. Page 78, yes. right hand column. <laughs> oh, that's right. Or in the second paragraph, yes. Guaranteed. Yes. Thank you. 
Yes, yeah, sorry. And the reason why it's relevant is obviously contract A is the contract which gave Sotheby's authority. It's not actually the contract of sale. Yes. But, but if the authority says you can enter into a contract that allows rescission in circumstances A, B, C, but, but Sotheby's then go, in fact, enter into a contract that allows rescission on, in circumstances X, Y, Z, then if rescission wouldn't have been allowed in circumstances A, B, C, then the principal can say, well, we're not liable to reimburse you because that wasn't a rescission in accordance with the terms that's, that's that we that's analysis Yeah, that doesn't seem to be. So, so yeah. Just a question of what the original so, terms so, so exactly, that's why it's just about what that means. So the, we say on a correct construction that an original owner who parts with uh, possession or sells the painting and then subsequently reacquires it is on that subsequent reacquisition a subsequent owner and so cannot enforce uh, the Sotheby's guarantee. Do we know um, uh, any, was there any evidence for the judge more relevantly um, about the transfer and the retransfer? Was it, was it uh, um, consideration? Was it there, there must have been some. My, well, I, my understanding is between 2011 and 2016, in 2016, according to the judgment. But we don't know any more about the circumstances. I'm reluctant to say what was known and what was not known. But it was known that Nevada had parted with the, the painting, but then it was back with Nevada in time for the, yes. the rescission itself. And it was parted with. For Mr. Hedrine, is that right? Who was to the, Mr. Hedrine, is that's my understanding. Who was the beneficial owner of Nevada, so it was just going from the from his vehicle company to himself and back again. Yes. I mean, and of course, when it came back, it was back in the hands of the original purchaser. Yes, it was, and it's, it's a. I mean, that's a very short point. It's, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yes. it, it is a very short point. And we say that the reason why it mean, say, means what we say it means is that if you give it any other meaning, it actually deprives. Some of the language of any meaning whatsoever at all. It already says you can't assign it. But then what does the phrase it will apply to the original owner, or will it only apply to the original owner and not to any subsequent owner? What does that actually add? We say that what that indicates is that once the original owner has parted with it, any possible liability under the guarantee comes to an end. And that's the end of it. So otherwise, you can effectively transfer, not by way of assignment, you can effectively transfer by just giving the next buyer in the chain a right to rescind on the same terms, and that one gives the next buyer in the chain a right to rescind. So it could, could pass through several hands. And then when it's subsequently discovered that it um, is or may be counterfeit, then it would run all the way up the chain back to Sotheby's and back to the original buyer, sorry, the original seller. One well, might be tempted to say, what's wrong with that? I mean, if it's a kind of oh. painting. But I mean, it's just a question of what the parties have agreed. Yeah, yeah mor morally, obviously, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but the loss has to fall somewhere. And invariably, yes. it doesn't fall on the forger. But you say that, that if it goes from the original purchaser um, to somebody else and back to the original purchaser, the, the, the clause has got to work even if the, somebody else was a third party at arm's length for, for money. The fact that it happened to be between alter egos no. It's not to, to define the, the clause. It makes no difference, Ab absolutely. And, and the fact that the person was, because it says it applies only to the original owner, and, and is, sorry, I'll make sure I get the language absolutely right. Not to only to be applicable owner. to the original buyer and not to any subsequent owner or owners. So obviously, when Nevada first get it, they are the original buyer. It, they then, the title is passed. And then when it comes back to them, we say they are a subsequent owner because it's subsequent to their original ownership. They now own it again. And, and that, although original buyer gets them in, the fact that they are also a subsequent, so they were the original buyer, the fact that they are, when they eventually seek to rescind are a subsequent owner means that they can't exercise the right of rescission, or at least Sotheby's shouldn't exercise the right of rescission so as to allow the painting to be returned. And well, as, uh, uh, as you've observed, it, it's a it's a short point.
but we say our construction is the only one that actually gives the additional language that's found in this clause and not found in contract B. It's the only one that gives that additional language any meaning or any effect. I well, apologise for that, I had to rush the last sections of that, but I thought it was certainly important to finish today. Yes, you were right about that. <laughs> Um, is, is that then the conclusion of your, your opening? It, it is. It is. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. Collins. Um, and we're ready to kick off tomorrow morning then. Is that. Yes, we will. I mean, your hand is whether we have 15 minutes and crack on. I'm happy to do or not. Well, I think we, I mean, we normally rise at 4.15, and I think you've got the whole of the day between you and Mr. Snow to deal with matters. And of course, the time for a reply. So I think if we. I think in that case we'll we'll adjourn now until um, ten thirty tomorrow. Thank you very much. Good class.